It's really a treat for us to be here with you, and quite frankly, I'm really looking forward to hearing the comments of this group of eminent leaders in American medicine today. Uh, the topic is the future of the Academic Medical Center. And we're going to have an opportunity to probe different aspects of what academic medical centers do, what problems they have, what they do in terms of solving our health problems, what the future is. It's always struck me as I think about traveling to different parts of the world when you go to Europe and you look at the great cathedrals of the, uh, of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance period as the icons of Europe, of each city, in terms of what they could accomplish, taking technology, putting it together, expressing the highest aspirations of the population of that time. And I have to say, today, if you go around America, it's actually our great academic medical centers that stand as the icons in a very similar way of the highest aspirations and the values that our population holds dear. This is a group of leaders who have set the standard even among this elite group of academic medical centers. Let me just briefly introduce the panel. Uh, to my far left is Daryl Kirch, who's the president of the Association of American Medical Colleges. This is the organization that actually represents and brings together the leaders from academic medical centers all over the country. Uh, next to Daryl is uh, Dr. Toby Cosgrove. Uh, Dr. Cosgrove is the president and CEO of the Cleveland Clinics. To my right, uh, Dr. Kenneth Davis is the president and CEO of the Mount Sinai Health Systems in New York. And to my far right, uh, Dr. John Noseworthy is the president and CEO of the Mayo Clinic. All I can say is if any of you isn't feeling well, you've got referral sources <laughs> at the highest level possible sitting on the stage at this time. But I'd like to begin the conversation, if I could. Uh, Daryl, maybe just asking you to tell us briefly, what is an academic medical center? What is it that distinguishes this set of healthcare providers and institutions from any other community hospital or place of getting medical care? You know, one of, one of the things that's been most interesting to me uh, as I came from working in medical schools and teaching hospitals to being at the AMC is the public doesn't recognize this term, academic medical center. So when we do focus groups and surveys, they scratch their head. They're not sure what it means. The terms that they actually recognize are medical schools and teaching hospitals. Those terms resonate most with the, the public. So uh, part of what we need to do is, is be more clear. We feel we understand them, but I don't think the American people understand their importance or their role. Fundamentally, it's this really interesting creature that we created in America where we had the professional school, part of a university typically, the medical school, but the feeling was, well over a century ago, that it was vitally important to link it closely to the actual delivery of health care and to also link it to research on health care. So what grew up over decades upon decades were these great institutions where you had not only the medical school, but you had the tightly linked teaching hospital, sometimes owned by the medical school and or the university. Uh, and they created a synergy, a remarkable synergy between the actual teaching, not just of medical students, but nurses, pharmacists, and others, the science that those faculty could do, but the actual direct care. So I guess I, I just finish by pointing out something that was stunning to me when I finally understood the numbers. These teaching hospitals represented here and among our members only represent 6% of all the hospitals in the United States. But those hospitals and their faculty deliver 20% of the clinical care in the US. And when it comes to something really special, if you need a trauma unit, a burn unit, if there's a severely premature baby, the odds are very high 
that the care for that, that person will happen in one of these teaching hospitals. So they occupy this very, very important niche in the actual delivery of health care. Um, when you think about it, it's amazing. The faculty in the business school don't run the big banks in town. The faculty in the law schools don't run the large law firms. But the faculty in medical schools are really core to these very, very important forms of care directly for, for American patients. No, thank you very much. You know, this uh, combination of the highest quality of care and an educational mission and a research mission, and you might even say also increasingly a community service mission, Absolutely. these are the characterizations, I think, of the academic center. But it occurs to me as you're describing many of them originating out of university that we happen to have three leading academic medical centers represented on the stage, each of which I believe grew out of first clinical excellence and then took up more teaching responsibility. And I'm curious, uh, I might turn to you, John, because uh, there was a, uh, certainly many decades of leading success of the Mayo Clinic before the Mayo began to provide direct undergraduate medical education. Correct. So how was the thinking of the institution to, uh, to drive it to want to be, in a sense, more complete as a provider in the terms that uh, Daryl was describing? Thanks, Harvey. It's interesting um, that I believe there are four non-university based major academic medical centers in Cleveland and Mount Sinai and Mayo were three of those and Baylor is the other one which is somehow sub somewhat separate so um, it's, it's an unusual uh, group you have with us today so at, uh, I think at Mayo Clinic the way it originated hundred this is our hundred and fiftieth year was a curious surgeon and his curious surgeon's sons and the first few folks that they hired to extend this curiosity in their original ledger, there's a famous statement, left open for future reflection. The senior surgeon mortgaged his home to buy a microscope when microscopes first came out and went on a big bet uh, and, and hired lab medicine to try to advance medicine even at that stage. They didn't associate with the University of Minnesota until 65 years into the 150-year saga. So I think it, ours grew out of a curiosity and understanding that research and education would be the foundations for the future. And then, of course, I'll finish it by saying, when they were still very young men, the, the Mayo brothers said, we will take all of our net worth and put it in a foundation for research and education to create the future of medicine, if you will. So that's our story. And it's, 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 there's a story at Mount Sinai and Cleveland and everywhere else. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the future, and we'll come to this, I think, the future of medicine in this country has largely originated from training the future work, workforce with education and discovery and clinical research and commercialization of that research for better diagnostics and better treatments that have largely come out of the academic medical centers. And then the community benefit, which is increasingly uh, recognized as important. To get to the practice, which is really key to what we all do in this country, is try to provide the highest quality care at the lowest cost, each of us have slightly different ways of approaching it. Uh, at Mayo Clinic, we've embedded engineers in our faculty going back 115 years to essentially help us solve the problems. Each of you have a different way of doing that, but we're all in the process of re-engineering healthcare to make it safer and more efficient so we can save the patients and the system the cost. So it's that curiosity, it's the research, it's the education that are absolutely critical to the success of the AMCs, I would say. Thank you. Uh, let me turn over, if I could, to you, Toby, because the Cleveland Clinic has been uh, renowned as a leader ac almost across the board in every medical area of specialization, uh, and certainly has taken up not only a national but an international profile in a way similar to our other institutions. Uh, but there must be key problems that trouble you, that bother you about the future and to keep you uh, awake at night. Uh, what do you see as the greatest challenges that you face either at the Cleveland Clinic or that you feel academic medical centers as a group face today? 
Well, frankly, we are very similar to Mayo and the rest of the, the hospitals with a tripartite mission. We were founded that way and have been education, research, and clinical care from the get-go. Um, and one of the concerns that we have right now uh, as we go forward is how we're going to fund the two arms, the research and education arms. And for years, we have always uh, supplemented uh, the research uh, and paid for a good percentage of the res research are done at our facility and the teaching. Mm -hmm. um, we have some almost 2,000 residents and fellows in training at any one time. And uh, about uh, a third of a billion dollars worth of research going on. Now, if we've seen what's happened is just take the NIH funding for research has now been flat for the last five years uh, and uh, during the sequestration was reduced 5%. So everybody now is feeling more and more competition for research funding. There's currently a bill uh, pending in Congress that would take out uh, the funding for graduate medical education, which is a major concern for us. And further, we know that we're going to be paid less for the clinical care that we provide. So I think probably if you looked at it across the organ our organizations, you would say the concern really is how are we going to continue the funding of these vital uh, fat things that we do. We can't shortchange the future by not doing research, and we can't shortchange the future by not uh, educating great physicians and scientists. Um, that's part of our obligation and, and part of what we do. And so we're going to have to learn a new way to do that. And we're going to turn to uh, trying to drive the efficiency in the cl clinical care so we can continue to do this. We're going to look at new ways of research, new ways of educating. Um, and I might say that I think the two areas where there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for innovation is in teaching. Uh, and in research, and the models for both of those hasn't really changed in 50 years. I want to come back to that uh, future innovation, but Ken, let me turn to you to ask you what you consider to be the greatest challenge that you face or that you think the group of uh, academic medical centers well, today face. Well, you know, Toby said it very well. Um, the business model just doesn't work any longer to cross-subsidize research and education. Um, <laughs> in our case, uh, we also have a very large system with some 2,000 residents and um, some 450 plus million dollars in research funding from various sources and largely from the NIH. Uh, we lose money in all of that. Um, we lose 10 cents on the dollar in every grant from the feds and uh, residency education despite what we think um, is, is accused of us in the press, it doesn't pay for itself as well. Um, but here's the challenge that we have. There has never been a greater time in biology than the generation that we're living through. The opportunity is extraordinary. Um, if we were a group of physicists sitting around 100 years ago and we had just discovered electrons, protons, and neutrons, and we thought of what the future would be, which became the century of physics, we probably would have never conceptualized that I could pull out my iPhone, take a picture of some of my friends in the audience, and send it to China within milliseconds with a little text under it. Um, but that's what the revolution of physics did. <coughs> We're living through the revolution of biology right now. Um, the opportunities are unbelievable, from genomics to proteomics, um, to big data, to our ability to understand that data. We have the opportunity to have a therapeutics of the future that is unthinkable. We may have at our disposal in 25 years an understanding of the biology of aging, and imagine what that would do. But the question is, are we going to be able to fund it? Do we have the will and the dollars to facilitate this revolution? Um, that's at stake now. And I think few understand how great the stakes are for where we could be and where we should be. Thanks, Ken. I was uh, reminded of your con in your comment of a, a wise businessman once observed that you cannot lose money on every sale and make it up in volume. Right. So uh, that's an important lesson. John, what keeps you awake at night? What is the, what is the challenge, the problem, the worry that you have that, that is most well, I think concerning? I think the panelists have spoken well to this. Um, and I think there is a future. We can figure this out. And we are the source of the solution. And, and I, I think we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, I think the public hasn't been educated about health care. So the public is quite naive about health care, let alone about what an academic medical center is, if you will. And the public is going to go from being 
uneducated or naive to being confused. And I think that's kind of where we're about to enter. What does it all mean for them particularly? Not just in terms of the decisions that they make about their own health and their own uh, uh, lifestyles and so on, but also what are they going to do with their insurance and buying high deductible plans and so on. And pretty, pretty soon they're going to go to be more engaged. And some of that will be anger, because they, and, they, and they will point fingers at us, I believe. They, they're not going to point the fingers at the government. They're going to look at the health care system that they can no longer afford. They may be able to afford the insurance, but they can't afford the care, if you will, kind of getting ahead of ourselves. So we have a wonderful opportunity, I think, to engage the public, the patients, in their own decisions. That's the wheels on suitcase going forward, candidly, is the Patients have to understand that the decisions they make and what they eat and how they live their life and the choices they make will help them live healthier lives going forward. And the obesity epidemic is sort of the cigarettes of our generation, if you will. And working with the public and getting the patients engaged and the caregivers engaged in the decisions and the care that they get, I think, is one of the paths to the future. So that helps me go to sleep at night. I think I do stay awake at night wondering how we're going to make this all work and, and we have a plan for that. And I also think that something we don't talk a lot about is a black swan event that could happen. And what do I mean by that? I mean a, a brand destroying uh, invasion of cyber, cyber security issues, if you will, and that's already happening in the private sector. It's happening in healthcare. There are bad things that could happen, if you will, and we're all trying to prevent that. I mean, we have a risk management map for the Mayo Clinic and everything on that map we have a plan for but what worries me is what isn't on the map and that's the black swan that, that I don't know quite what that is and we all know it you can get to sleep if you have a plan if you don't know what you're dealing with that's anxiety and you're awake all night so that's that's what I get away I, I'm wondering what I'm not thinking about great I want to yes Daryl go I, ahead you know I think my colleagues have really outlined very real threats to what have been these great institutions, but I, I also think we need to acknowledge the social threat to America. Um, I mentioned that only 6% of the hospitals are these teaching hospitals. They deliver 50% of the care to uninsured patients. These small number of hospitals, this small number, represents the safety net in many cases for our society. Uh, they're often dealing, for those who heard Reese's eloquent talk this morning, they're dealing with those communities where education and poverty uh, are so acute. So there becomes this very real actual social threat that goes beyond the risk to the individual institutions, the research enterprise, the education, that I really wish the country could understand better. Daryl, could I just jump in just for a second, because I think you hit it right on the head. We can talk about our own profession or our own organizations, but excellence in America, I hate to sound so dramatic, is really at risk here. We have led in not just biomedical research, but science, technology, engineering, and math, and defunding that, and essentially putting the situation in, in, in such risk. It's the gener I'm looking at the generation ahead of me, the young scientists and students who are going to be doctors and so on, we could lose a generation, and you can't. You can't lose a generation of biomedical researchers and make it up. You can't lose a generation of committed people who want to be physicians. So it's really, I think it's actually a national issue. I think it's a, patri it's a, it's a patriotism issue, if you will. We want to be strong. We need to solve this as a nation. Let me, let me uh, pose a question and uh, juxtapose two parts of this, though, and I'd love to get your responses to this. On the one side, uh, we make the strong case as to why we need in our society institutions of the character that we're, we're describing and why our nation and the world needs the research and the forward-looking commitments that institutions that our, our academic medical centers represent. On the other side, uh, you may have seen this recent article in uh, uh, in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, written by Bruce Alberts, a very renowned scientist, and uh, uh, others uh, with him, uh, saying basically that our whole me biomedical research enterprise is premised on the idea of 
increasing flows of funds. And we're not going to have increasing flows of funds. And so the implication of that is even if individually Mount Sinai, the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic are each correct in the commitments, the investments, and the directions, our nation as a whole is not going to be able to continue on the path as a whole as we are. So how do we reconcile that? Toby, what, how do yeah, you well think about that? Yeah, this is what I was uh, alluding to when I talked about we hadn't had any innovation, really. Yeah. Because if you look at a, a scientist, he now, or, uh, an investigator, he goes into his laboratory, he develops whatever it is, and he does not share that until he's got his paper accepted in Nature, yeah. uh, so that he can then get the funding for the next one. Now, there are probably also 15 people around the world that are working on the same problem. And if you stop and think about it, you know, we now, every, every time he comes to a problem, he's got to get a new piece of equipment or hire new people to help him get through that particular problem in his project. We've got to have more collaboration. I mean, if you look at the incentive model, mm -hmm. Innocentive, they have gone out and they have, uh, when they come to a problem, they farm it out and say, if you can solve this problem for us, we'll pay you $10,000 or whatever it is. And they get suggestions from all over the world. Yeah. We have got to have a more collaborative uh, research activity uh, because we can no longer have uh, uh, an identified uh, issue where somebody is, in, has, is rewarded for hoarding the knowledge until, and then rewarded for bringing this knowledge forward. If you stop and think about research, what we're all trying to do is move the ball ahead. Yeah. And why should we all have to do it singularly? Great point. Uh, other comments well, on this? There's, yes, there's a lot. There's a lot to be said about yeah. this article. Yeah. Um, but the, the point that I really want to make is, you know, we just have to understand that um, healthcare is changing, and we're going to have to change with it. We can't afford everything that we want to do, um, so we're going to have to prioritize what we do. So what we should look at is the ecosystem of innovation and ask ourselves, how many places along that ecosystem do we have dysfunction that keeps us from being as innovative as we can and as effective as we can? Let me give you some examples. Um, we put in the Affordable Care Act 12 years of exclusivity for biologics. So what does that mean? That means that pharmaceutical companies will preferentially develop proteins and antibodies. What is the consequence of that? It means certain diseases are winners, other diseases are losers, and it also means that we're going to make very expensive drugs, because that's what proteins and antibodies are. We also have an orphan drug act. It's a good thing. It produces drugs for conditions that are very, very rare. But it's created an entire business model such that if we look at a lot of the most novel compounds that come to the FDA every year, a very large proportion of those are for orphan drugs, orphan indications. Right alongside of that, we have a public health epidemic in Alzheimer's disease, in type 2 diabetes, in addictions, in a whole bunch of psychiatric conditions, but we don't have any incentives along this innovation ecosystem. We have to sit back and ask, what are the dysfunctionalities in this system from public policy and fiscal policy that decreases the likelihood that we'll get the therapeutics that we really need to bend the cost curve? That's a really uh, fascinating point, Ken, po both about the cost and about the problems that actually beset most of the population that we are not, not actively working on. John, how, what do you think about this tension between the total pool of resources and the needs that we've been talking about. So we've looked at this um, and recognizing that we're spending more than $2.8 trillion managing health care in this country and not getting the results we want. Internally, we looked at that and said, well, what's actionable by the medical profession? People are getting older and living longer. Technology is costing more. A lot of this we can't control. But the country's spending too much money, and therefore there's not enough to invest in excellence and go forward as we've been talking about. So we just broke it down internally. And we looked and we said, well, two things that we could do something about, and perhaps the country could do something about, is the fragmentation of healthcare, the overutilization of healthcare, patients going from here to there, if you will, 
That's responsible for about $215 billion a year in waste. And then the uneven quality, and perhaps I hope you haven't, but some folks have had the situation where there are pockets of excellence and there are pockets of mistakes made, if you will. And so we basically, and that's about 185 billion, roughly. So there's 400 billion dollars that are just sitting there providing no value and contributing essentially to human suffering. And so well, we can't fix the world at the Mayo Clinic and none of us can, but we said, well, what we could do about the fragmented care is we could codify how we work, digitize our knowledge, create a knowledge content management tool that helps physicians and nurses in practice learn from our team medicine how you handle complex patients and use that to integrate large healthcare systems around the country to keep most of their care in their community and have instant access to what Mayo knows to lower the cost of care. And that's, we built out a national network of non-owned affiliates. We didn't buy any of these. This is, a, this is not a merger and acquisition. This is essentially join the Mayo Clinic, subscribe to this information. You'll have 24-hour, 24-7 access to our information and to our people. And if you need to, you come and see us. And we're finding that 90% of the patients that are accessing this stay home. They don't need to travel for extra tests. They just need someone to synthesize it. So that's an alternative. It's a low-cost alternative to the M&A strategies, and which <coughs> often raise the cost of care as opposed. And then the quality issue is a big issue. Toby's talked a lot about this at the previous session. We're now transparent, much more transparent about what safe care looks like. Yep. And we're investing heavily in that with the private sector. We've come together, if you can believe it, with United Healthcare, the largest insurance company for profit in the country, and have created an innovative Bell Labs-like unit that has, a hunt, has claims data from 150 million Americans over two decades, and we're linking that to the outcomes with our nine uh, uh, partners. What works in healthcare? How do you provide good care to a diabetic to keep them from losing their vision or needing a transplant? So again, some of this is within our control to improve the quality, share it so we can all learn from each other, because none of us have it right, but also help people get better care at home by sharing our knowledge as opposed to hoarding and asking people to travel great distances to the tertiary care center. And we need to work in the government. And we basically have to get the government to modernize how we're paid so that there's an incentive to work in teams, provide better outcome, and then use the savings of that to invest in the NIH. I mean, it's, it's not that hard. And ultimately gets back to solve the problem that Ken was talking exactly about, and priorities for his needs. Toby, I want to come back to you for a second, and, and Daryl, too. Did you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I, you know, I think the other thing is we yeah. have to redefine, you know, we all say we're in health care. Yeah. Good Lord, all we do is take care of sick people. Yes. It'd be awfully nice to actually be in the business of providing, keeping people healthy. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have uh, had a small experiment with our 40-some thousand employees and we've seen by managing their chronic disease by providing wellness for them we've decreased uh, hospital admissions uh, by 20 percent we've decreased cost and we've flattened the curve and if we begin to decrease there's only two ways that we're going to reduce the cost of healthcare in the United States one more efficient care delivery and two decreasing the burden of disease yeah. and we ought to be we talk about ourselves being in a health care delivery we really have concentrated on sick. Let me ask you, does this mean that the uh, missions of the academic health centers, if we can call them that, instead of academic medical centers, ought to embrace not only clinical care, not only research, not only professional education, not only community service, but also a culture of health, as Risa was talking about this morning? Is that a fair yeah, I challenge absolutely to believe that. our academic center? Yeah, I absolutely believe that. And we've rolled this out into the community. And I think you're seeing this happen all over the every, place. Every campus I visit has been making the transition from being an ivory tower to being engaged with the real world that's around them. And, and one of the ironies is that many of these great institutions sit in some of the poorest <laughs> neighborhoods absolutely. in our country. Or and, poorest cities. And are, they are engaging. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but other things are happening. Going back to this cost problem, yeah. uh, 
if, if you haven't seen it, I, I strongly recommend to anybody in the audience, uh, there's a website now called choosingwisely.org. And it represents the first time that physicians, I think, have ever come together as specialty groups and said, where are we over-utilizing services? Where are we failing to follow the evidence? And each specialty was challenged to list the five things that they need to rethink whether they're doing too much of that. And so if you have a disease or if you're seeing a specialist, go to that website, choosingwisely.org. You can click on any of the specialties. And it's fascinating to see doctors own the problem of overutilization. And many of those efforts were led by faculty from academic centers. The other thing that I think we all acknowledge is one way to control cost is to have better team-based care. Yeah. <laughs> and that really means getting beyond medicine to getting to true interprofessional teams. And, and a lot of the, the centers sitting here have been doing great interprofessional work. Harvey, the, uh, the, the public's not quite, not quite ready for investing in their own health and wellness. It's, it's coming fast, but so we tried something that didn't work out as well as we hoped. We opened a, a lab at the Mall of America up the road from the Mayo Clinic and essentially had the public come, consumers come, and they wanted to buy the hats and the cookbooks. But when you said we can do a, a health screen, a wellness screen, <coughs> not paid for by your insurance, but it would cost $175 or whatever it was to find out is your blood pressure well managed, they all just walked out of the store because, Amer again, naive Americans are not used to paying for health care, let alone wellness. But I think you're right. I think this is coming very quickly. To be candid, four years ago we changed the mission statement, why we exist at the Mayo Clinic. Uh -huh. That may not sound very important, but it, it is when you've had the same one for 150 years to provide the best care to every patient every day through integrated practice education research. We changed this to say to inspire hope <coughs> and contribute to health and well-being while providing the best care. Blah, 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 blah. It's to Toby's point, it's it's we're, and and we're ahead of that. We're investing <coughs> in it. We have wonderful programs, but candidly, Americans don't want to pay for wellness advice. They, they'll pay for massage, cosmetic surgery, that sort of stuff. But the other stuff, it's going to take a while for that to take off. You know, it reminds me of the patient who uh, just has the exam and the doc says, well, you know, everything seems to be all right. All you've got to do is uh, quit smoking, cut down on your drinking, uh, lose 35 pounds, get an hour of exercise every day, and try to reduce the stress in your life. And the patient looks at the doctor and says, can't you operate? <laughs> so uh, we're not used to taking responsibility ourselves. I think it's, uh, I think it's what, an issue. For what we, uh, what we need to do. Uh, Dale, I want to, sorry, go ahead, Toby, you wanted to jump Yeah, I want to, I want to pick up on the team uh, business, you know, Please. and, you know, if you stop and think about it, we all have a vision of that community doctor coming with his black bag, uh, and uh, that's, that's not how healthcare is anymore, it's, and that's how most of us probably sitting on the stage were trained, yeah. and we were individuals, and healthcare has gotten way too sophisticated, the total amount of knowledge in healthcare is doubling every two years. Uh, and so we have to ha have team play. Yeah, we looked at the number of people who touch a cardiac surgical patient, 130 in the team. Wow. Uh, and so healthcare is now a team. And so we have rearranged uh, our education and we're building a new campus that will include dental school, nursing school, medical school in one physical space that they can share the learning together uh, and they can begin to understand, break down those silos, because we've got to have team play, and people have got to learn it right from the beginning, and that is one of the huge changes we have to make in healthcare. Well, we've talked about a lot of these forces and a lot of the, the drivers for the academic uh, medical center today. I, I'd like to ask each of you to reflect on what will be the biggest changes in the next 10 years that you envision for academic health centers. How will they be different? 10 years from now, in 2024, we come back to Aspen, what will be different compared to what we see today? Ken, let me start with you. Um, a number of things. First, 
we'll all be in the risk business. I mean, fee-for-service medicine is going to be dying, except in the most affluent communities. So we'll all be managing populations, and that means we'll be putting greater emphasis on prevention and wellness, and we'll be investing in those programs. Um, and if I was to predict where patients will be at that time, instead of the complaints that we hear now about how I was overcharged and I didn't know what I was getting into and on and on with all the horror stories we hear, what we're going to hear are patients saying, I was denied care. That those doctors were making money by keeping me from getting the surgery that I needed or the antibiotic that I should have had, and we're going to go back to the HMO fights. Um, but it's inevitable. Um, business model can't survive this way. We'll all be taking risk. And the last thing I'd like to say about that is it will raise real questions for how the insurance companies will operate. And the degree to which the large healthcare systems like ours will become their own insurance companies or de facto insurance companies in taking all the risk. Great. Uh, John, how do you think things will be different in 10 years compared well, to 10? Well, the way I'd like to see it play out, and hopefully it won't take 10 years, it may take longer, is that the least engaged member of the healthcare team, the patient, is engaged. And the patient is then the center of their own universe, if you will. And we take advantage of the digital tools and all the information that's available, curate that for the patient and their caregivers and their families to make the right decisions. That's number one. The practice, I hope, I hope we will have created a transparent database that the patients can go to and understand the quality and the cost options for them. And I think that'll be tough. Toby, again, talked about that a few moments ago. But I think we can be there. And that will allow us all to move more quickly. So if they're doing things really well at Mount Sinai, Toby and I ought to send a team down and say, how did you manage to get a higher value index for your total hip replacement than we have? Yep. And we share that. Again, it gets to Toby's question, comment about hoarding. Number three, we'll be training a totally different workforce. And we've challenged our group to say, what does the workforce look like? Well, part of it's the patient and the caregiver. It won't all be doctors and physios and nurses, hopefully. It'll be folks who can be taught online to provide better care in the communities in rural America and the rest. Research, I'm just not sure quite how that's going to play out. We've done very well with research and innovation in this country. We're the world's leaders. I think we'll find a way to make that happen. There may be more sharing of data. The private sector will be more involved. There may be more incentives. There will be more help from benefactors. But Americans can't, and I think if they understand, they will not let this country lose its engagement in creating the future of health and healthcare and biomedical research and science and technology. It's just a bad thing for the country. So that's what I would say. Great. Uh, Toby, what's going to be different in 10 years in your view? If, if you wouldn't mind, since I happen to be aware of it, I don't know what the status is of the Watson experiment going on at the Cleveland Clinic. This is the computer that IBM created that beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. The all, anybody a Jeopardy fan here? Uh, well, uh, you, Ken Jennings was like the world's greatest human jeopardy player ever, but Watson won. And now, Cleveland Clinic, I believe, is one of the two places where they're working with Watson in medicine. Is, is that going to be available in 10 years? Well, Watson's going to medical school with Cleveland Clinic, and I have good news and bad news. <clears throat> the good news is, is Watson is a hell of a medical student, can learn everything. <laughs> The bad news is it's not fun on Saturday night. <laughs> but so, so we think that, uh, you know, as we bring into this the medical school that I described to you, we think that Watson is going to come into that because that is going to, you know, the, as the amount of knowledge explodes, yes. we've got to have help. Yes. Um, and so I think that, that Watson will be part of that uh, and help, uh, a doctor helper, a doctor extender, however you want to look at it. But I think if you look at, <coughs> excuse me, the future, where are we going to get treated? Who's going to treat us? You know, the diseases we're going to be treated for uh, is, are all going to be different. Mm -hmm. who's, who's going to treat us? We're going to see a lot more physician extenders. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, where we're going to get treated, we're going to get treated increasingly in the home, in outpatients. And the academic medical centers are going to be essentially like what's happened at the Cleveland Clinic right now, we're the highest acuity hospital in the United States. 
um, and 25% of our beds are intensive care beds, and I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to have uh, academic medical centers at the center of a complex of hospitals. Things like childbirth will be taken care of in the community where they belong and not at the academic medical center, and you're going to see a uh, really high-tech medical center in the center of a system. Uh, and then further, I would say the diseases we're going to change and we're going to treat are going to change. Hmm. The diseases we're going to treat are going to be more chronic disease and much less acute disease. So I think the whole future of what we're planning for is greatly different. Thank you. Dale, what's I, your I would agree with future? all the trends cited. Uh, and I would boil it down to, uh, to many of the ideas that were expressed to a culture change. So the academic medical world I grew up in, these places were meccas of rescue. They were filled with expertise. Uh, it was where you wanted to go if you were really, really ill. And that will still exist. That will still be needed. But I think the culture shift will be that this connection that you all have alluded to one way or another with the greater network where the goal isn't just to sit and wait for people who need to be rescued, but the goal is to keep as many people as possible from needing that in the first place. And that that pushes people not just out to regional community hospitals, not just out to doctor's offices, but in a lot of cases has them working on their health at their computer terminal at home. And I think that culture change from being expert-centric to being patient-centric could be extraordinary and it could really fit with the culture of health uh, that we heard about earlier today. Yeah. Well, I'd like now, if I could, to turn to our audience and invite uh, your questions. Uh, I will recognize you as well as I can see you with the lights only here, but I see the gentleman on the end and then someone a few uh, <coughs> steps over. If you could introduce yourself and uh, if I do recognize you, please wait till you have the microphone as you do now. Thank you. This is an excellent discussion. My name is uh, Altman. I'm a gynecologist uh, here full time, trained at one of these major medical centers at the Brigham and Mass General. My question to you in this excellent discussion is where does medical liability fit in? Where does, what, what kind of solutions do we have that will allow us to practice without getting a huge battery of tests and, and allow us to limit and do it appropriately without the fear of this concept of medical liability? Well, thank you for the question. Who would like to begin a response? Uh, I'll tread uh, <laughs> very lightly on a, on a tough topic, but there, there was a study that was published last summer where doctors, several thousand doctors around the U.S. were asked, who bears major responsibility for health care costs? The number one party identified were trial lawyers. <laughs> so the doctor's belief was that that was where the, the cost problem really resided. And then they went down. They, they blamed hospitals, health insurances, health insurance companies, drug companies, way, way down. They only said 30% of them said doctors bear major responsibility. So I won't deny that liability claims are a problem. They're greater in some states and some specialties than others. You're in one of those situations. But I think as a profession, we've made it too easy to identify that as the source of the problem, and we haven't been aggressive enough looking at what we do. That's why, again, I'm so enthusiastic about choosing wisely. Yeah. Well, I, look, I, think, I think that this is going to receive much more attention as the hospitals uh, find themselves in greater, greater fiscal stress and we need to find ways to make care less expensive. Um, and I would be surprised if we can't find some bipartisanship around the notion that there are treatment algorithms that we can all accept and that those algorithms provide safe harbors for physicians. Um, that was close to being in the ACA. It didn't get in there. You know, maybe in the next administration when we start to rethink health care, this will come up. 
I've also seen how when uh, in our captive insurance company, which we own with a few other hospitals in New York, when we focus on quality and we have treatment algorithms that we can all accept and we fund and identify the risks that we have enormous positive outcomes. Um, we've been able to decrease in your area, in OBGYN, the number of cesarean sections by a substantial amount, the number of preterm births, the number of inductions. Um, and we focus first, of course, on OB because that's where the, the, big, play, the big costs are. Um, but it's happening well in gynecology. So I think we can do more and we will do more. And I'm much more optimistic than I were years ago about this. I think you also have to look at the, the data, which says it only accounts for about 4% of the total health care bill in the United States. Uh, and I think that that, that was never going to be touched with the Accountable Care Act. No. I, I, I actually, though, I, I think you could argue with that, that I think behavior, and I think our physician who asked the question says that his behavior and his practice yes. is different because of it as opposed to the, mm -hmm. the, um, the uh, tort reform that's necessary. I, I guess I would just say a bright light has to be shined on this and we need a, a more mature conversation than we've had. I, I really appreciate the question. There's actually a long list of health-related challenges that fit into that category that's, of yeah. need. But let me recognize there was a second question that I saw there, if you could speak, and then I'll come down here to this gentleman if uh, he could get a mic afterward, please. Um, my name is Carleen Verine. I work in uh, addictions. And two of the things that I heard during this discussion were, first of all, it, there seemed like there was a consensus um, of the need to involve the patient more in his or her own health care. Um, and another thing was the shift from moving to treating more chronic diseases than acute. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a coincidence or just an interesting fact, but that a lot of the chronic diseases that have high profile have a really important element of patient choice, patient behavior, patient lifestyle, uh, whether it's diabetes, addictions, hypertension, things like that. So I'm wondering if one of you can maybe speak to sort of the intersection of, of those two realities and how that's going to affect how we need to move forward. The, uh, one of the most interesting changes that's happening is the, the admission test to medical school, which our association designs in this coming year for the first time isn't just going to include biology and natural sciences, it's going to include social and behavioral sciences as a clear acknowledgement that those contributors to health are as powerful as genetic and biologic contributors. So I think we're finally acknowledging it. We're acknowledging it at the very beginning. So now pre-med students all over the nation are scrambling to take courses in health psychology and uh, related disciplines, which is great. You know, I also think we've been pretty paternalistic as a profession, uh, and we didn't share the, the medical records with the patient, uh, and that has changed. We now have two million patients who have access to their medical charts, and it's now possible to do it on an iPhone. Um, and as the patients get involved and understand what's going on, I think they get more, uh, take better care of themselves. I think if you put up a pie chart of what contributes to health, healthcare is 10% of that pie chart. If you look at the other contributors, genetics, behavior, social conditions, environmental conditions, those are all 20 to 40% to your point. So what, and we've talked a little bit about it here, if we're just fixing sick people, we're, we're not really addressing the other multifactorial contributors that you, that you outlined. But that's, that's a rough idea of what that pie chart looks like. I'm, uh, I'm going to recognize this gentleman, but I'd love to hear a uh, reflection from the leaders, each of whom has articulated, I think so clearly and compellingly, a rather dramatic expansion and redefinition of mission. But building out of a institutional tradition which is predominantly grounded in acute and intensive care, as leaders of these institutions, how do you go about effecting this kind of transformation? Uh, is it by new hires? Can you use it budgetarily? Do you do it by uh, moral uh, discourse with the membership and the leadership? What tools do you have to make the kind of changes that you've all been talking about and that our questions have reinforced? I yeah. think all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. Daryl pointed out that um, so many of the academic medical centers live in urban areas that have a great deal of impoverishment. Um, we live that way at Mount Sinai. 
and uh, the consequence is that we see the social necessities that we have to address in order to facilitate better health care outcomes. And one of the things that the ACA did was through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, it provided some funds that made possible the investment in people that allowed us to take our position in the community and expand upon it. Yeah. So um, we found out, for instance, that the best way to diminish readmissions and the use of the ED in impoverished communities with patients who have multiple chronic diseases was not to educate them about their disease, was not the assumption that they just didn't get it or they just didn't understand how serious diabetes was. It was to help them with their employer so they could get off from work, so they can go to their appointments. It was to make sure that the filters were changed in their apartment on the HVAC system so that if they had COPD, they could breathe. Um, it was to make sure that the heat came on in the winter. Um, it was to make sure that they understood that because they didn't have enough money for food, that that carbohydrate, which was called fruit juice, wasn't the same as a fruit. Uh, we needed to do those things. It was impossible by CMMI, but it points out that your point that the healthcare system, the academic healthcare system, is if it's not embedded in its community, it will fail. Do you want anything, John? From your well, I'll just here? make a point. I think uh, because you asked about how do we do it within our institutions, yeah. and I think Ken brought in the community, which is absolutely critical. This is all about change management. I didn't know what that was 10 years ago, and now I know what it is because <laughs> I'm living it. Um, but the key, at least for our staff, is they have to understand why do they have to change. If they understand why they need to change, at least you can engage them in the conversation. And they're not interested in the financial health of the institution. They're interested in the patient. And the fact is, no one has really owned the message in this country that almost every American is going to be paying more out of pocket for their health care. No one wants to say that. Yeah. And if you have, and most health care workers are deeply committed people who want to do the right thing. And so if you say to that nurse or that technician or that secretary or that intern or whomever, we're going to work together in teams to improve the quality and reduce the cost. We're going to have to work differently because it's the right thing for the patient. It otherwise, the patient will struggle more than they're struggling currently with the fear of their illness and the cost of their illness. Mm -hmm. But we're not there yet as a society. No one has really said what I just said, at least not very loudly. I, I don't understand why politicians don't want to say that. But I think that if people understand, if committed people, healthcare workers, understand this is good for patients, they're more likely to change their old habits and try to work in teams as opposed to being solo players. Yeah, and let me just add, add on to that. Right now, there is a tremendous depression across the healthcare uh, uh, enterprise. And if you look at Kubler-Ross's Degrees of Freedom, there was denial, and we certainly have been denying this change was coming for a number of years. Now someone's moved their cheese, and it's an anger and we're going to depression and gradually we've got to come out the other side. And I would posit that one of the things that's going to get us through this curve of grieving is to have a vision about where we're going. The ACA did not create a vision of where this country needs to go. There's no Emerald City on the Hill. And if we had the Emerald City on the Hill, we'd know the steps to get to the Emerald City on the Hill. It's up to us, and I think as leaders of academic medical centers, to create that vision of what a healthcare system in the country ought to be and begin to take the steps to get there and to begin to lead the medical profession and the medical enterprise through this Kubler-Ross's degrees of, of grieving. <clears throat> this is serious depression across the country, and we've got to, and physicians have got to be engaged uh, to get us through that. I want to recognize that gentleman, but just before I do, uh, I, I apologize, but I can't resist, Daryl, in all of this discussion, including Toby's uh, reminder of how much is the responsibility of leadership in academic medical centers today, is this idea of, uh, of uh, change management a topic that you find on the top of mind of the leadership that you're working with? It is top of mind everywhere because it isn't just changing the way we deliver health care. 
we are simultaneously transforming our approach to education yeah. and research. Yeah. Uh, people say changing health care is like redesigning an airplane in flight. This is like redesigning three airplanes in flight. It is very intense change management, but I believe it's our only hope to get where we want to get Thank with the health care system. Now I will recognize this gentleman. I think this will be our last question. Uh, so my name is David Muller. I'm <coughs> Dean for Education at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and I'm an internist who takes care of the homebound elderly. Um, <coughs> you're all familiar with the term triple threat, uh, which referring to a member of the faculty or a faculty recruit um, means someone who can do it all an outstanding researcher, scientist, an outstanding educator, and an outstanding clinician. And the term has fallen in and out of favor over the course of time. We used to think that that was the recruit you always wanted, and then I think that the feeling has gone more towards the other end of the pole, which is to say it, there almost is no one who can do all three of those things. Maybe two out of three ain't bad. So the question I have is related to that and how we see our academic health centers. Is it possible that the next decade or two are going to drive a fundamental change in this um, idea that we can all, each of us can d do all of those things? Or is it going to have to be um, structured completely differently? We all provide maybe outstanding clinical care, but some of us tackle education, others of us tackle science. Great final question. Uh, I, you know, one of the beauties of, of American academic medicine is its diversity and richness. So there are now 141 US medical schools. And more and more, rather than each trying to replicate one another, they're saying, what mission makes sense for us where we are? There are new schools that have an unabashed emphasis on primary care. There are others that are really training the next generation of translational scientists. And we need it all. So I, I think you're really pointing out a very important thing, which is the country needs a rich range of medical schools uh, approaching different kinds of missions. Any other final comments? This is an opportunity. It's a great, great comment. <coughs> the primary value of Mayo has always been the needs of the patient come first. That's what we say and what we try to d deliver every day. Our new dean of research, who a number of you, you know, has said the purpose of research is to, is to meet the unmet needs of patients, at least at Mayo. And what, what that's speaking to is the discovery scientists and the clinical scientists have to be hand in hand with those that are teaching the workforce and delivering the care, identifying what do we need answers to, what are the needs of the patient, and what are the unmet needs. And I think that's a way that we can get beyond the three. And candidly, if you think about your, yourself, I don't mean yourself personally, but the triple threats, they were usually better at research or better at clinical care or better at teaching. You know, you can do all three, but it's, it's, I think you were right, it's pretty hard to be the best patient-centered physician as well as being a discovery scientist. That's pretty hard, and also teachers. So at least, I think it's the team approach. And again, being united with a common goal of what are we trying to do together as a team. So. Well, can since, since um, David and I live together, yes, he knows, my, he knows my view about this. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it's hard to be excellent in everything, and that it's great to be excellent in one thing. Um, so we want to have people who are spectacular clinicians, spectacular educators, and spectacular scientists. But they're rarely all in one individual, and even two out of three is unusual. Um, but what does that mean, ultimately? Because the downside is that we wind up siloed. And that would be the worst outcome that we could have, Absolutely. because then the great clinicians aren't telling the scientists what are the <coughs> clinical needs that they have. And the educators don't know what's the cutting edge that's going on in the science. You have led team teaching at Mount Sinai and educated all of us to the notion that the best groups of people with the most successful outcomes are those that have multidisciplinary, accept each other, and are able to value each other and work together most effectively. And that's where we're going to have to be in order to take advantage of our excellences and recognize that there will be no more triple threats. And Toby, this brings us back to the collaboration point that you started us out on. Any final comment you want to offer? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I took a page from Mayo Clinic's book and we made our mantra of patients first, which I think uh, puts uh, everybody who, whether you're a researcher or you're a teacher or you're a clinician or administrator or you're working the loading dock, everybody in the institution has to understand that they only have, uh, there's only one reason that they're there. And then the reason they get paid for, they get paid is because of that. Uh, and that's the patient. 
So if we keep that as our North Star, I think we're going to be pretty well guided. I think there is another area in healthcare that has been strangely uh, appointed, and that's leadership. And leadership in the past in academic medical center has been done primarily on the basis of your, your curriculum vitae, not on the basis of leadership. And, and we've taken a very major change, and we think if you're going to be in leadership, it's about leading people, it's not writing papers. And so we look for people who actually have the capacity and we try to train them to be leaders. And I think once you do that, you begin to collaborate better uh, across all of those things we've talked about. Well, thank you. I think we've been so fortunate to hear from four outstanding leaders of academic medicine in the United States today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Art.